The Kremlin, March 2023. The last time Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping met in person. It was a year into Putin's war against Ukraine, and just after Xi was reconfirmed as China's supreme leader. And amid the global chaos the war unleashed, Xi was doubling down on this relationship. I think that the way that Xi Jinping came to Moscow in March this year, showing his unequivocal support, basically, not saying that he approves of the war against Ukraine, but saying that the first state visit is to Russia. He comes extra to see his friend in the Kremlin and spend nearly three days with him. That's a big show of support. Check out what she said when leaving the Kremlin, speaking through his translator. Right now, there are changes we haven't seen for a hundred years, and we are the ones driving these changes together. It sounded like two men on a joint mission to end America's era as the world's dominant power. Shared animosity towards the U.S. is very much the glue that brings the two men together. So Putin and Xi are getting closer and teaming up against the United States in what some are calling the beginnings of a new Cold War. Now it's Putin's turn to visit China. So what's his trip all about? China's massive Belt and Road infrastructure project is the peg for the visit. Beijing is hosting an event to mark its 10-year anniversary. But there will be much more on the leader's agenda too, from the increasingly close military relationship between the two sides to Russia's huge supplies of fossil fuels to China. Moscow is hoping to get the green light for a new gas pipeline that would boost this trade even further. Just as important will be the optics of the visit. How strong a message of unity do the two leaders send out? All this will set Xi Jinping up for the next summit that's rumored to be in his calendar with US President Joe Biden next month. It'll be the next serious opportunity to take the temperature of this new Cold War. Russian President Vladimir Putin and China's Xi Jinping have met in Beijing. China's marking the 10th anniversary of its vast belt and road infrastructure project. Putin called Xi his dear friend. The Russian leader is guest of honor at the summit. Over 130 heads of state and representatives are there, largely from the global south. She said the trust between China and Russia keeps growing. Let's go to Beijing correspondent Fabian Kretschmer. This is Putin's first trip to a major global power since Russia invaded Ukraine. There's an international warrant out against him, but China was never going to hand him over to authorities. No, it was uh, obvious he would not get arrested here, but rather that the officials would roll out the red carpet. Uh, first of all, China does not recognize the International Criminal Court, so from a legal point of view, they can just ignore the warrant. But also, um, the Chinese government has so far not um, criticized Russia for the war in Ukraine, not even with one syllable. Um, they didn't even name Russia the aggressor in this conflict, and they don't even call it a war, they call it the Ukraine crisis. So that gives you an idea to what degree actually um, China has sided with Russia. Just how buddy-buddy are she and Putin becoming, though? Yeah, quite. I mean, uh, you can even argue that uh, beside the political friendship, there's also a personal friendship. Um, they are a meeting for the 42nd time in the last decade. Uh, that is really record-breaking. And uh, when Putin arrived here, they were, uh, Xi Jinping and Putin, they were shaking hands um, during the uh, group photo um, of the Belt and Road Forum here in Beijing with all the head of states. They were placed next to each other. Also, when uh, they were giving speeches, uh, they were sitting directly ne next to each other. So they are really very close. And and um, I think you can argue that there's some personal chemistry between those two head of states. Putin really needs uh, customers when it comes to selling its oil abroad after sanctions were put on it. Um, but what about the relationship from the other side where you are? How much does she need Putin uh, economically and politically? Well, Russia is um, China's biggest neighbor. They share a border of more than 4,000 kilometers, so they have to get along already uh, by that uh, perspective. But, um, of course, uh, Russia is also very important when it comes to uh, China's energy security, uh, when it comes to supply of oil. And, um, uh, yeah, so also I would say the biggest aspect is that they are political allies. They both um, want to challenge the Western world order. They have same uh, or very similar political views when it comes to, um, yeah, the, 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 they are against the West. 
so to speak. And uh, so they share a lot of uh, values. But uh, when you ask how much does uh, Xi Jinping need Putin, I would also argue uh, how much does Putin need Xi. I think um, uh, vice versa, it's even more. I mean, jun uh, Russia is clearly the junior partner because China now has become economically uh, much bigger in size. And um, you can also see it in terms of trade numbers. Um, uh, China has a lot of, uh, you know, tr uh, diversified trade uh, globally. But for Russia, really, um, China is by far the biggest trade partner. So I would say the dependency is more the other way around. And Russia's war effort, of course, is costing a, a, a lot of lives and money. And uh, this is all on the sidelines of this Belt and Road Initiative, which some countries have been pulling out of. And she opened the forum warning against decoupling. He does sound worried about China's economic future. Well, I mean, um, it's not Xi Jinping's strength to, you know, publicly admit weaknesses or, or uh, self-reflect. So I would say his rhetoric is still uh, very confident. But you're right. I mean, uh, especially since the pandemic, the Belt and Road Initiative or the New Silk Road, as it is often called, has encountered a lot of problems. Um, I mean, many states couldn't pay back their loans and um, they were deep in trap towards the Chinese that brought some problems. And uh, also domestically, actually, um, the willingness and also the popularity here among the people to spend billions and billions of taxpayers' money in the global, global south while actually the budget here um, is uh, also empty and you know, China faces uh, its own economic problems. Uh, so that has really decreased uh, the popularity of the Belt and Road Initiative. So what China is doing right now is uh, basically transforming this uh, Belt and Road Initiative. They want to make it less financially risky. They want to open it more also to foreign investors, also investors uh, from uh, the West. And um, I would say if you um, view this initiative... Uh, holistically, then I would still call it um, to some degree a success. And you can see that also by the fact that, um, for example, the European Union and also the G7 nations, they are coming up with um, alternatives uh, to compete with China. They start their own infrastructure uh, projects in the global south. So you can see that um, there is a definitely um, the notion that you know China is gaining uh, global influence and um, the West wants to counter that with their own uh, model of um, investment. To talk more about this, I'm joined now by Jacob Gunter, a senior analyst at the Mercator Institute for China Studies. Jacob, we hear a lot of talk at the moment about shifting global power dynamics. How would you say that China's position on the world stage has changed since it launched the Belt and Road Initiative 10 years ago? Yeah, it's, it's changed quite a lot. Um, I mean, when, when you look not only at the, the Belt and Road Initiative and how that has shaped China's own position in the world, um, you also have uh, kind of a rising China as not not only kind of the factory of the world, but an increasingly innovative um, competitor to uh, sort of the traditional G7 um, dominated world. So um, not not only has this significantly changed, um, you know, China over this period, but it's it's really had a significant impact in the world. And looking at how the BRI has shaped China's relationship with a lot of individual countries um, uh, that effectively China has created an alternative to the traditional Western sort of partnership model. Um, and for a lot of countries, that's, that, that gives them options that they previously didn't have. How does that alternative look, though, in concrete terms? What sort of options do these countries actually have? Yeah, well, unfortunately, they, they don't have a ton of options because I, I would personally argue that uh, um, the United States, Europe, uh, Japan and others um, have not been doing as much as they need to 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 offer real credible alternatives. Um, and frankly, uh, if, if you're you know, part of the global south and um, you're trying to promise your voters and your constituents um, you know, some sort of major infrastructure project, um, if you, you kind of have the options between working with traditional Western partners that might take five to 10 years for one of these projects to come together and it's incredibly complex, um, whereas China's offering something that, you know, they, they show up with a one-stop shop and they can do the entire project in a couple of years and uh, voters are happy, constituents are happy. Um, and so even if you end up with something that's not as good as it could be, um, or maybe it has uh, you know, more negative environmental or labor impacts than it should, um, if, if the options are between you know, A and B, um, you're going to take B with China um, in a lot of these contexts. I want to look a little bit more closely at some of these projects. So you mentioned innovation, because when we think about the Belt and Road, we generally tend to envision things like bridges and ports, big traditional infrastructure. But it's about more than that, isn't it? 
Yeah, it, cer it certainly is. Um, first off, uh, the kind of a broadly under-recognized aspect of, of the Belt and Road Initiative is energy. Um, so the, the one area that has been pretty well covered is um, China's contribution to a lot of coal burning uh, power plants around the world through the Belt and Road Initiative. But um, I, I think that a lot of the impact that we're seeing um, from the, you know, the, whether it's transportation infrastructure or energy infrastructure, um, it's really about Chinese, mostly state-owned enterprises, being able to kind of penetrate into markets and develop, um, you know, stronger trading ties uh, with those countries. But I suspect that moving forward, we'll see a lot more um, of kind of a digital and a green energy dimension um, to the Belt and Road Initiative, because not only are those areas where China is quite strong, um, it's area, those are areas where um, major Chinese companies like Huawei are running into more and more restrictions in a lot of the developed world. Um, and so there will be a need to kind of be able to push um, China's uh, tech uh, capacity um, in the telecoms and digital space um, into these alternative markets. Would you say that these restrictions from the West actually play into China's favor then in that sense? Um, I think they do to a certain degree. Uh, I think Huawei would probably be much more interested in, uh, you know, building out the, the American 5G network or the Japanese 5G network than they would, um, you know, some, some developing countries that maybe can't build as extensive of, of networks um, just from a cost perspective. So I, I think if 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 given the option, um, they would rather not have those restrictions. Um, but those restrictions, nonetheless, do have an impact beyond just the markets themselves that have those restrictions. Um, and in this case, I, I expect and anticipate that it's going to to really push uh, what they call the digital Silk Road um, into a lot of the global south, because that's where the export market's going to be for those companies. I'm interested in how this project is being viewed from inside of China, especially in the context of a slowing economy. We have heard reports that China is planning to make its loans less risky and to involve the private sector more in this project. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, I think it's actually part of a, a broader trend that um, has developed throughout the, the entire sort of era of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, you know, uh, we we have the uh, the Belt and Road Forum that's taking place right now, um, or taking place this week. Uh, uh, but this is, of course, the third of these fora. Um, so if you go back to previous years and you actually compare Xi Jinping's speeches, it the first and the second one, it goes from this big, grandiose vision of reviving, you know, the the Silk Roads and um, you know stitching the world together through Chinese-led infrastructure projects. And then you go to the second Belt and Road Forum, and there's more of a focus on maybe some smaller projects, more of an emphasis on environmental and financial sustainability, um, more of an emphasis on technology rather than just the the big traditional infrastructure projects. And I I, I would expect that we'll we'll hear something similar from Xi Jinping um, uh, if if he decides to speak, which I expect he would um, at the Belt and Road Forum uh, in Beijing. Uh, and we'll hear a lot of talk about, you know, as they call it, small is beautiful is sort of the new saying going around in Beijing these days. Um, so I, I would expect that, that those trends will continue. Um, and and look, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is, you know, 10 years old. Um, it it probably is a strategy that needs to adapt and needs to change from Beijing's perspective. So um, I don't think they would view the fact that they need to make changes, that that means that the Belt and Road Initiative was a failure. Um, it's just that they need to adapt their strategy. Uh, yeah, so if small is beautiful, why the grand vision? And, and is this something China would regret, this overarching branding? Well, uh, they, they may come to regret it. Uh, this this is a thing that um, China is incredibly good at the marketing side of things um, uh, and, and pushing this grand vision. Um, you know, a good, a good point of comparison would be uh, if you look at the kind of investments and project financing and stuff that happens from the entirety of Europe put together. Um, in most of these countries, it would actually dwarf what China's done. It's just nobody thinks about Europe building a power plant or Europe building a port. They think about uh, Siemens or, or Schneider Energy building um, a power plant or Maersk building a port. Um, they don't think of it as Europe. So China's really good at this branding, but it does oftentimes come back to, to bite them um, at the same time. Uh, so, you know, thinking about how the West, which is finally starting to put together some alternatives 
um, that that was really instigated by this big grandiose vision of the Belt and Road Initiative that um, maybe could have flown under the radar a bit better um, had they not been putting everything under this big umbrella um, with this grand vision. Um, and it, it's, it, it brings to mind, um, you know, something similar that happened back in uh, uh, 2015 when this Made in China 2025 plan came out. Um, that utterly terrified um, uh, all of the, the European and American businesses <laughs> uh, because this grandiose vision that they had to kind of catch up in all these technologies and take all this global market share um, created a, you know, it was kind of a dream scenario for Beijing, but it was a nightmare scenario for, for a lot of foreign companies. So I think um, that kind of came back to bite them in the same way that maybe the grandiose vision of the Belt and Road will. Another thing that came back to bite was that Italy uh, had second thoughts about getting involved in this project. Would you say Italy is a real outlier here or are there other nations that may want to exit? Yeah, I think, I mean, Italy's probably an outlier. Um, for, you know, the vast majority of countries that, that have signed on to the Belt and Road um, Initiative are developing countries of, of varying statuses. and. Um, you know, from their perspective, there's there's no real diplomatic pressure um, uh, and there's no real major trade off to um, continuing to sign you know, these agreements and continuing to be a part of it and kind of give face to Beijing. Um, I think Italy was under a lot of pressure because, you know, major European economy, part of the G7 and such. Um, and when you when you compare the amount of investment and financing of projects that come um, through the Belt and Road Initiative, um, at a macro scale, it's a lot of money, you know, uh, give or take a trillion dollars over the last decade. Um, but when you go state by state um, and project by project, you know, these get smaller and smaller. And if you're a developing country in the global south, you know, a one or a five or a ten billion dollar project is a huge deal. Um, if you're Italy, that's a drop in the bucket. And, and so I think Italy had a lot less to lose um, in, in proportion of terms. Um, and there was more to gain diplomatically by by removing themselves from that. And I just don't really see, a, you know, a clear incentive for a lot of the global south to do that. Let's look at some of the most prominent attendees at this forum. We know that Russian President Vladimir Putin is taking part, um, but representatives of Afghanistan's Taliban regime will also be there. How are we to understand China's role in the world in that context? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, China uh, um, has surrounded itself with all sorts of good friends <laughs> these days. And uh, I mean, you you look at the relationship with Russia, and clearly there's um, there's not only a a sense of okay, we're going to part, we're going to kind of partner together um, because we, we both of these major countries are having sort of their own facing down moments with the United States um, and its allies. Um, so. You know, they're they're friends in that regard. Um, but also there seems to be a very legitimate, close personal relationship between Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin. Um, as as to, you know, the Taliban, for example, um, I think I, I, I wouldn't expect that that Beijing imagines that it's going to be able to kind of go in and, you know, fix or solve Afghanistan or anything like that. Um, I suspect that they look at the situation, they accept the reality that the Taliban's in control and they say, well, you know, we share a border with this country. It's a very small border, but it's a border nonetheless. And they don't want the instability um, that, that can emerge out of that country um, and has emerged out of that country over the centuries um, to, to kind of spill over. Um, so, you know, maybe there are some Belt and Road projects in Afghanistan in the future, but um, I would expect that those are going to be more geopolitically motivated than they are, you know, by commercial interests uh, or anything like that. When China says that small is beautiful, how does this apply to its digital infrastructure, for example? Because it seems to me that what you're saying is that China wants to be a little bit more quiet about this project now than it was 10 years ago. Where will this be in a decade from now? Will we still be talking about the Belt and Road or will the, the power that China is, uh, is demonstrating in this just be, be somewhat softer and more subtle? Yeah, I mean, whether whether the Belt and Road Initiative as a brand continues to exist or, um, you know, whether they adapt to something else. And we've seen some indications for that. There's, you know, this global development initiative and 
global security and global civilizational initiatives, all these new things that Xi Jinping is pushing out. Um, and maybe maybe the Belt and Road, Red Road gets folded into that. Maybe it continues to exist as its own thing. But whatever happens to the naming and the branding, what will happen is it will continue to have a significant impact um, on the global economy. You know, uh, whether it's the traditional infrastructure, like all these ports that, you know, um, we don't see a whole lot of new port development in the Belt and Road Initiative, but we don't need to see new port development. They're already there um, and they're already changing how China trades with those countries and how those countries trade with the rest of the world. Um, and they're making them, you know, kind of closer uh, uh, and more, more closely tied um, to China as, as the main trade and economic partner. And then when you look at like the digital um, and the green energy side of things, um, I would expect that that will um, continue to develop and develop quite strongly along what they call the digital Silk Road. Um, and again, a big part of that is that uh, they're going to need export markets for companies like Huawei. Um, and it's gonna be quite valuable to be able to have, a, you know, bring a lot of the China's digital champions um, through that, uh, that first kind of footprint um, in terms of building out, you know, a telecoms network uh, in a lot of these countries. But one one thing that I'll I'll be looking looking at quite um, quite you know closely is how does China's growing digital footprint in a lot of these countries um, affect uh, that country's relationship with China um, and that country's relationship with the rest of the world? Because um, you know uh, the hard the traditional hard infrastructure. You know, of course, that creates, um, you know, a certain amount of influence that China has over the recipient country. Um, but we've seen really clearly how disruptive, um, you know, digital manipulation can be um, around the world. Um, and that's including in, you know, rich develops um, economies. And so um, the, the concerns that I have about what possible digital footprint um, and digital control that China might be able to export um, through through these sorts of uh, networks that they're trying to build up. Um, that That's going to be a really important space for us to keep an eye on. How do you monitor that? Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, a little bit outside of my expertise. I've got uh, some, some great colleagues that look into that um, a bit more closely. But um, yeah, I mean, it's in, in many ways, think of it uh, the same way that we try to monitor you know, uh, disinformation that has historically come from Russia and from Iran and from other places um, and how that impacts, you know, our own systems um, and thinking about how much more depth there might be if a lot of the digital ecosystem was de developed by Russian programmers and by developed uh, by Russian engineers um, so that not only are they kind of doing, utilizing the, um, the, the, the soft dimensions, but they also can control the hard dimensions of, of that infrastructure. So. Um, I'll, I'll leave it to the cybersecurity folks that uh, that actually understand um, how that technology works. But thinking about what that footprint could mean, um, I think, is an important question. And again, I think it creates a sense; it should create a sense of urgency um, in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, and elsewhere. Um, that if we can't provide, you know, credible alternatives and affordable alternatives to help build out um, the the digital ecosystem and help with the digital transition for a lot of these countries in the global south, then, you know, China is going to be a really useful partner to them. And, um, you know, they, they may not have the luxury of, of, you know, choosing a more expensive system from, from a, a Japanese or European supplier, um, or, you know, taking the American kind of digital footprint and, you know, bring it into their country. Um, so I, I think that that should be a real focus um, for, for the liberal democracies of the world um, over the next like 10 to 15 years is how can we compete with China um, in expanding that digital footprint and um, sort of helping a lot of these countries uh, with their own digital transitions. David Gunter, you've given us a lot to think about. Senior Analyst at the Mercator Institute for China Studies, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.